Excellent. Okay. So it worked. <laughs> yes. Hello, everybody. I got the scare a bit for a minute because it showed me the previous uh, live. And I was like, oh no, it happened again. <laughs> so it worked. <laughs> Excellent. So I've been hacked by my own live. <laughs> you can laugh. It's always the same. I <laughs> forget it. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. You can disregard this. We will play it for the bloopers. Again, I will make a special video with the bloopers. Well, I will have many. Uh, today is the Christmas special. Come on, say hi. Hello hi. from Santa. We have <laughs> with us uh, oh. Dr. Beatrice Mingo from the Open University. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining from the UK. Thank and you for inviting me. And from the universe, very, in, in a galaxy far, far away, apparently. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, this galaxy is called Hercules A. Hercules A. We like, it. We like this galaxy very much. Also, I like the pink in this galaxy. So the and the choice of color was very nice. <laughs> it's slightly Christmassy. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a diluted Christmas. It's festive, no? Yes, and the little light at the back, very, very Christmassy background. And uh, hello to you at home. Uh, good. Hope yes. you're watching. Oh, uh, Merry Christmas. Tell us where you're from, write it on the chat, interact with us. So we will have a little uh, informal chat with Beatrice and in between the chat, we will play the quiz. So we will not wait until the end of the interview to play the quiz. We will play in between, two, two questions at a time. So if you don't see it, let me, uh, let me share it again. The quiz link is going to be on the chat in a second. So. This is the link for the quiz. Click on it and you can start playing already, but we will play together and with Beatrice and say how many things I know, how many things Beatrice knows and how many things I don't know because half of the questions were um, done by Paul Hombach uh, from Bonn. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so let's begin. Let me find. So you, you're in the UK now. Uh, where are you from originally? So I'm originally from Spain, but I'm sort of half Italian in complicated ways. My mom is Argentinian, but all her family is Italian. And I went to an Italian school. So my education was kind of half Spanish, half Italian. Oh, how very nice. So you speak many languages. Well, I, I, my Italian is rusty. My Spanish is only slightly less rusty. These days I speak mostly English. But yes, I, I really like languages. I started learning German and Russian at one point as well. They're long forgotten now. Wow. Okay. German, I know it's ridiculously difficult. Ridiculously. I've yes, been... you know that very well. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in this country for uh, six years and I, I've done three beginner courses. Oh, and gosh. still, yes. And still, it's like, it's the language that hates me. <laughs> it's, um, it, it's, as we say in Greece, we have a saying, it goes in from one ear and comes, comes out, out of the other. <laughs> the other and it's like like Hercules say. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, yes, but Russian, that is, wow. Wow. Do you know any words now? Do you remember? Uh, I could say, Harasho, which means okay. Okay. Dobreidin, um, which is good day. Or Dobre Rosa, which is good morning. Uh, oh, very nice. I can also say I don't speak any Russian. Um, <laughs> that's the extent of it. I can still understand Cyrillic. Uh, you probably can understand Cyrillic very easily because you know most of it is is like the Greek alphabet anyway. Um, but yeah, I I did a few lessons many years ago, but it was a very good method, and the little bit I learned has almost stuck with me, but not enough to survive. Oh, okay, I see. Wow, but that's really you know. Uh, adventures, I say, and when <laughs> learning a language like that, it's, I've heard it's extremely difficult. Although in the region, you know, they, a lot of even young people speak speak it. Hey, you know, you're excited. Like, you know, the little monster here will make the, the sound effects. <laughs> so um, let me find my notes. Uh, and I haven't introduced, I haven't said your CV yet, because I was hoping we do it together. And uh, you tell us a bit about uh, what got you into science, astrophysics, 
and uh, how you ended up in the UK at the Open University. So um, I guess as a child, I wasn't as interested in science as other children, because unfortunately, like you probably know this as well, we, we came from very sexist environments when we were kids and we were kind of steamrolled into humanities are for girls and maths are for boys. Um, but eventually as a teenager, I discovered science fiction and I discovered, you know, outreach books on physics and I was absolutely blown away. Um, so when I was a teenager, I decided I wanted to be a physicist and, and I wanted to be either an astrophysicist or a theoretical physicist. So mm -hmm. I did my, my degree in Spain when I finished school. Um, I did a, a combined master's and bachelor's degree in physics and theoretical physics and then moved to the UK to, to do my PhD um, at the University of Hertfordshire. This was uh, between 2009 and, and 2013. And I mostly did X-ray observations of, of these active galaxies and, and radio jets. Um, and then I worked in Leicester for a few years. First I did like a more science-y based um, position. And then I did a calibration position for the SWIFT uh, Neil Gerald's Observatory, which is a, a, a telescope that chases gamma ray bursts. Um, and then I moved on to radio waves and uh, moved oh. to the Open University where I've been since 2017. Wow, where is the Open University? It's uh, a, in a town called Milton Keynes, which is about 16 miles north of London. So about, yeah, uh, 80, 90 kilometers north of London. Yeah, I know Milton Keynes. We used to go there because there was an outlet. <laughs> For other reasons. I, I think up to a few years ago, it had like the longest shopping center in Europe or something. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I don't know if that's something to be proud of. But... <laughs> Uh, we and my friends we used to be in Oxford, so ah, we yes, drive there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we would drive there, especially for that outlet, because we would find uh, many uh, nice things for cheaper, let's say. Yes. Uh, you know how expensive the UK is. So. Mm. Oh, uh, yes. And um, yes, I, actually, it's very interesting what you say, because uh, I know a lot of people that uh, decided to do a career and actually settled on their path much later in life and not yes. from the beginning and that's that's actually very nice because it shows you that you know you you're discovering little by little what you want to do yes and, uh, you can do many things you don't have to have a plan from the beginning this is something that i've actually seen a lot in the uk the uk is very good at this i, I have had many many colleagues that have changed careers like you know in their 30s 40s even in their 60s once they retire they decide that they want to do a, a master's and a PhD in something completely different. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the UK has been very, very good at promoting that. And, and some of them do go on to, to build science careers after that. It's not as bad as, as other countries. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, that's very nice because it's also acceptable by the society. Yes. Uh, whereas, I don't know how is it in Spain and Greece, it's really frowned upon, it's considered yes. a failure if you do a change of career. Yes, I think uh, it's, it's, it's similar, yeah. And you have to have uh, a career path from when you're at school and you know, become an engineer or an architect or a doctor, you know, yes. or a lawyer, you know, this high pay yeah. uh, occupation. So otherwise you are considered a failure in yeah. all the circles and maybe we should Take the example of uh, the UK yes. and get out of this, uh, you know, um, small world, let's say. Yeah, and make things a, a little more equal and a little more accessible as well. I paid my way through university through work mm -hmm. and my, my teachers in Spain were, were horrified that I actually worked to pay for my degree. And, you know, something so basic, let alone, you know, somebody who has a family or who has personal, different personal circumstances or who comes from a different background. So we're not going to solve any problems with accessibility unless we become a bit more open-minded and, and we start, you know, making things easier for, for people with different backgrounds. Yeah, that's that's very important, especially uh, now nowadays that we're discovering all these problems with accessibility. And yes. we want to include more people in science uh, from all backgrounds, uh, from all countries. Um, so I think uh, there's a, a lot of room for growth, let's yes. say. We're missing out on a lot of talent until until we open that up, I think. Definitely, definitely. I agree, I agree with that. Um, so your current position is um, in the Open University and you do radio astronomy, right? Yes. Like like the object at the background with these yes. gloves. But before you said you were doing X-ray astronomy. Yes. And so my question is for the audience, 
So what is the difference between X-ray astronomy and radio astronomy? So uh, radio astronomy is at the very low energy end of the electromagnetic spectrum and X-rays are almost at the very top end, you know, the very, very top end is gamma rays, but X-rays are fairly close. So you can say that in, in that sense, they are kind of opposite and you would think that they are not related at all, but both actually study the same sort of energetic phenomena, uh, something, some processes that we call non-thermal, like again, the jets that come up from um, active galactic nuclei, supernovae explosions and supernova remnants, any processes that have to do with magnetic fields and you know, uh, anything that has to do with what we call particle acceleration. So particles moving in, in these uh, warped or, or dense magnetic fields. It's something that you study both with X-rays and with radio. Um, X-rays also study like the very hot gas that is in the intercluster medium. In radio, we just study the things that happen in the intercluster medium, like these massive radio jets and, and lobes that you see behind me. So they have similarities and, and they have differences. Observationally, they are completely different. So you have to learn the techniques from scratch. And I think radio is a lot harder than, than X-rays to master. X-rays is great because you're outside the atmosphere and you don't have to worry about <laughs> it. Yeah, so uh, maybe our audience doesn't know right? That you cannot observe at the x-rays from the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Better is to, to send um, uh, telescopes in space outside yes. the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, if, if we didn't have an atmosphere to protect us from x-rays, we probably wouldn't be mammals, we probably would be some sort of evolved cockroach or something like that. <laughs> we would survive coronavirus for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I know bad joke, but yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, we have to have we have to have a bit of humor in this uh, situation. I cannot still believe it's a pandemic, really still. Um, but I have I have another question because you said intracluster medium, and can you explain what this is for uh, our audience? Maybe they don't know this concept of the intracluster medium. So galaxies, you know, some of them are a bit isolated, but most of them actually live in what we call groups or clusters. They, you know, they form from big, big clumps of gas and evolve in different ways. But these big clumps of gas form more than one galaxy at a time. So uh, there, there is still some gas remaining in the space between the galaxies. Some of it is actually expelled again through things like this. If you can see the, the thing behind me, so that's where the elliptical galaxy, the optical galaxy is. This, this is what you see with, you know, optical telescopes or Hubble, you know, your, your favorite optical telescope and then we have these things that you see in the radio these these jets and lobes that just blow material in the space between these galaxies and the gas in in this in this space is very very rarefied you know it is it's, it has a very low density but it can be very hot uh hot enough to to emit in x-rays uh this is a process we call feedback you know these gas can fall into the galaxies and form further generations of stars and at the same time these galaxies with their black holes and with their supernovae explosions push some of their own gas away back into back into the intercluster medium. It's a it's a cycle, eh? it's a yes. procedure, it, uh, it repeats. It repeats so, and it's something that we need to understand to, to understand the evolution of the universe. Um, and uh, in the radio, we observe from the ground, right? We don't, yes. we have, I mean, we have radio telescopes around the world and smaller radio telescopes, radio uh, arrays, uh, let's say, but we don't have, we have one. We have one, yes, the Russians have a, teles a radio telescope in space to create a, a network, and I think that's actually working now, but I, I haven't seen any data from it, but I think it is working. I think it, it's linked to the Event Horizon telescope. Yes, I think so. So we can make a telescope the size of the Earth and uh, zoom in into these galaxies, yes. <laughs> the one that you showed behind you, and see Right, right, what's happening in that black hole and try to understand what is a black hole and how are these jets launched and uh, these, these producing some really nice, uh, really nice um, results. So I, I, let's, um, let's have a small break and go to one of the questions. What do you think? Do you feel lucky? So guys from home, uh, I hope you can see uh, hello from Venice Winter, great. Hello, hello to you too from Vienna. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't read the emails before, uh, the messages before. Let me share my screen. Yes, I'm always looking for the quiz. So, uh, the link uh, is on the live chat. Okay, so click it and you can start playing. 
oh, you, someone already played. Thank you very much. So, it's not Pexis. Oh, little Santa helper wants to play also. There you go. You can also play. So I will read the, the first one. Um, sorry, excuse me. You want to read it? Loud. Okay, I read it. The Christmas tree cluster NGC 2264 lies in the constellation of, let's see, Orion, Gemini, Taurus, or Monokeros. So the Santa's little helper gave me an answer. What, what is your answer, Beatrice? Any guesses? I'm going to fail so horribly at this. I know nothing, but I do know a few things about optical astronomy, but not <laughs> this sort of thing. Um, I, think it's I have no idea. I, I would probably say monokeros, but uh, I, am, I am not sure at all. Very nice, very nice. So let's see. Okay, I'll do the following. Um, I'll open the link. So. Monokeros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Monokeros. So monokeros. Uh, I'll open the link and let's play this properly and see how how we do, right? Monokeros, okay. So we're voting monokeros, you guys at home. I don't know what you're voting, let's see. So look, it looks like a Christmas tree, right? And it's very pretty. So let's do one more and then we go back to bed. I have the next one. You have the next one. I know it. You know the next one, okay, tell me. It's in Friday. We have, we have to read the question first. So the James Webb Space Telescope, okay, J, J, JWST, will bring us pictures from the earliest stars in the universe. We look back in time when the universe was very young and the first stars were being born. And it has very high sensitivity, it will do very high sensitivity observations at which wavelength? I know it. You know it? Tell me. Infrared. Infrared. Oh my God, he, he's a born astronomer, what? <laughs> okay, that I was an easy one. It. Click it. You clicked it, okay, good. Uh, then if you win, you will win a Christmas present from me. So we will stop now the quiz and go back to oh. bed. We will continue later, it's okay, it's okay. okay. We will do the whole thing. Okay, I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting. Amazing, I haven't even said anything to him. I'm gonna drink something. Okay. As you see guys, we, we're very relaxed today. It's a party atmosphere. I wish we could do this in a pub. Maybe next year, maybe you can visit us here. I would love to, I really would. I really miss traveling and, and seeing people. And you can uh, give the colloquium uh, in uh, Tautenburg and we can take you out in a pub. Oh, that would be nice. I haven't been to Germany for so long. Yes, yes. <laughs> I have to start studying German again. <laughs> I mean, you can you can start uh, practicing and then you can order for me too. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go to my questions about active galaxies that you know I love, I love active galaxies. It's like if people ask me what I love about the universe, this mm -hmm. is what I love. Yes, prosehe, prosehe. Um, I want to you to tell us uh, uh, your time as an X-ray astronomer, uh, you wrote me uh, that you held the satellite calibration position, and that intrigued me. And I want to learn more. I so, what what is this? I did the other question. So, calibration is what we do to ensure that the instrument is always consistent. So, um, with telescopes, we just point, uh, you know, twice a year or so with with the one I was working with we point at known astronomical sources and we and we look at pointings from similar telescopes at the same astronomical sources because we know what they should look like mm -hmm. and we and we look at what the results are and we and we make sure that they are consistent essentially we adjust um we adjust the results so they are consistent so when you get your own observations mm -hmm. you know that they are reliable this is because so i worked on swift as i said the, the swift near and uh, neil Gerrans observatory which is a, a gamma ray hunting telescope which uh, has an x-ray and a hard x-ray nearly gamma ray um, instrument uh, and this chases gamma ray bursts all across the sky okay. um, but it's in a low earth orbit which means that it gets constantly bombarded with charged particles which damage the ccd mm -hmm. um, we didn't expect this telescope to last for so long it was launched i think in 2004 so it's, it's been out there for, for quite a while 
and it's it's given incredible results but obviously it requires some degree of, of maintenance and it's a maintenance that we cannot do in person so we we do this via software we compensate for the for the degradation of the ccd numerically and we need to do oh. this on a regular basis to ensure that your observations are are accurate okay oh so the ccd gets damaged and then you have to solve for that in your exactly when when you send these x-ray telescopes same for xmm newton same as what happened for athena you know you have them very very far away you cannot just send the you know a spaceship to to go and fix them mm -hmm. anything that needs to be fixed needs to be done remotely so you can reconfigure the instruments to some extent and you can numerically fix uh, things like again loss of charge in the ccds when you know when the instrument degrades to compensate for it and sometimes when you know when we have had micrometeorite impacts in some of these uh and you know it, it destroys one or two pixels and you just can't use them anymore yeah oh well it happens it also it happens. happens in a you know in ground telescopes i <laughs> i will tell you a story <laughs> this is hilarious because it, it's true i've seen it it's true and i have a photo so uh, back in the days when I was doing the PhD, I went to the McDonald Observatories in um, West Texas. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a very nice area inside forest, beautiful. And there are a lot of telescopes there. And the one I visited, the 107 inch telescope. So it has, it's an optical um, telescope. It has a mirror and uh, the mirror has a hole from uh, a gun. So someone shoot at the mirror. <laughs> Apparently, yes. I don't know. I don't know exactly the story. There was some dispute. Someone was angry. Someone got fired. I don't remember. It was such okay. a long time ago. I but mean, there is a hole in the mirror. But you know, they never fix it because it doesn't really interfere. And it's not one of the uh, most expensive telescopes. I mean, the slit. So I was doing spectroscopy, optical spectroscopy, and the slit was a Zillette scissor, you know. It's very nice. Yeah, I mean, uh, it said the Zillette. So. I mean, I've, I've gotten frustrated with my data a few times. You know, I can understand astronomy can be very frustrated when you don't get the answers you want, but I probably wouldn't shoot at the telescope. <laughs> so it can happen, you know. Well, we're only human. <laughs> Yes, the, I mean, the meteors don't really do this on purpose. It's just that space is a very hostile environment for things. Yes, and uh, I'm wondering, all this um, debris around the space, uh, the Earth's orbit, yeah. uh, that there are hundreds, no, thousands of uh, uh, tiny little rocks or whatever, broken satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, so they pose a threat even to... All, to the International Space Station and to all of these telescopes we have mm -hmm. uh, out there. And as you said, we cannot send someone <laughs> to fix it. It's not possible. That would be nice though, right? There are some ideas for missions to rescue some of these space debris, but the problem is, you know, you can, you can have like a big magnet that collects some stuff, but it's over such a large area. Mm -hmm. And some of it is not magnetic, you know, it's just plastics and ceramics and stuff. And how do you connect that? Some of it travels so fast as well because of where it is, you know, slowly decaying into, into falling onto Earth again, that you, you just cannot stop it. it it's going to punch a, a hole through anything. So it is, it is a big problem and it's only growing with satellite micro constellations and stuff like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, now and uh, with the satellite. Yeah, sorry. Yes, we will do it now. Like someone is anxious to do the, to quiz. Do the quiz. Oh my God. I think we're uh, getting too serious here. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> not just following the Christmas spirit, <laughs> talking about destruction and meteorites. And yes, it is. Um, the, it's a big problem with the satellite constellations, uh, with all these uh, flying uh, rocks around and debris. Okay, good. So that's amazing, though, that you did that. I really, yes. I, re I, re I mean, it's amazing to have different experiences and. Yeah, uh, I think it also helps you understand astronomy more, right? Yes, yes. absolutely. Because, it, it, you know, the science of it was very different from my field and, and it was very interesting. The thing I don't miss is being on call because, you know, GRBs are very, have very, very short duration. So you have to catch them and ensure that the telescope serves in time. So we were on duty uh, and you had, you know, you had a 24 hour gap in which you had to be on call for the entire 24 hours. So if you got a GRB alert at two in the morning, you had to get up and check that the telescope was doing things and write a report and wow, post it. Okay. So, yes, the, the gamma yeah. ray bursts, yes. I, I was observing once at the WHT 
in La Palma, and we got uh, an alert for a follow up. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We got a follow up, and it was not something very exciting, but you know, <laughs> some of them are. <laughs> but but uh, you know, someone wrote a paper, and my name is there, so <laughs> that's good. <cool. laughs> More publications, yes. you know, astronomers love publications, guys. I mean, this is what feeds us, you know, they don't pay us too much money, but they, they pay us with publications. Um, I'm making jokes. All right. Okay, my favorite, 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 favorite. And uh, I'm sorry, guys at home, maybe you've heard about this topic before, but it's my favorite. So we will hear about it one more time. What are active galaxies? So Almost every galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the center. The, ones, the only ones that we think don't have one are the very, very tiny ones, the dwarf galaxies, like the satellites in over our Milky Way, you know, the small and large Magellanic clouds. Uh, and somewhere there might have been some sort of collision and they lost part of their centers. But almost every galaxy has a black hole. And we call these galaxies active when that black hole is actively eating gas. So our Milky Way has a black hole, but it's not active at the moment. It doesn't have anything to, to have lunch on. Yeah. Uh, but the ones I study really, you know, they, they do. And we see this activity both through, you know, light uh, that we see in the optical. We also see in the x-rays and in the infrared. And we see it sometimes through jets, like the ones behind my head. And uh, those are spectacular jets. And you study jets that are very different from that, right? Not all objects, radio objects in the universe look like that? No, not all of them. They come in different shapes and forms and in different powers. I mean, you can have tiny, tiny, wimpy ones that never actually leave the host galaxy. You know, if, if this is like, I don't know, like a, a fireman host, you know, with a very powerful jet, you can have ones that are like a garden house, <laughs> which is very low power and it's just, you know, you know, you have to water grass. So it can, it can cause some ripples and some effect on the host galaxy. And uh, these ones actually affect, you know, much larger distances into the intercluster medium. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, all, these things are very important energetically to, to understand the evolution of, of galaxies. If you think about it, you know, it's a way that the black hole can influence much, much larger scales. It's like comparing, you know, something the size of like a tennis ball influencing something the size of the Earth is like comparing the, the black hole to, to the galaxy. And these things obviously go much further away than that. Yeah, that's amazing. It's like, uh, it's something that we cannot really understand, right? I mean, you have this black hole in the center of the galaxy that we don't really know yes. how it got there. And uh, we're trying to figure out <laughs> how it got there. We need to study the first galaxies that formed. So hopefully with the new generation telescopes, yes. we can do that. Uh, and then it emits all this different radiation and different wavelengths. And uh, yeah, we, we really have no idea what this Black hole, I mean, we haven't, we've observed it, we've observed the matter around it. Yes, we will do the quiz. Maybe you want to say the things, batteries, about what is a black hole, because I am not allowed to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so a black hole is just a, a large amount of matter concentrated in a very, very tiny point. The tiny point is so tiny that the geometry of space time as we know it, which is, you know, the, the thing where all the universe is, uh, kind of deforms beyond beyond the normal laws of physics that govern our everyday lives. That is all a black hole is. It's so dense that even light cannot escape it. That's why we call it black because it cannot emit any light. It's like it's like a hole in in space. Yes, and uh, what uh, what triggers the black hole? What uh, triggers it to start shooting out things? So uh, I should probably mention that we don't, we don't quite know how supermassive black holes form. So we know how small black, hole forms, uh, black holes form from the evolution of a star, of a very massive star that eventually collapses. And you have so much material collapsing that even you know, some, some complicated quantum physics laws cannot actually stop the implosion. And we think that the, the ones that are in galaxies form through you know, merging of these smaller black holes or maybe some what we call primordial seeds. So the conditions of the early universe were very different. And maybe uh, some of these black holes formed with, with already fairly high masses at the, at the very early stages of the universe. Uh, but what it causes, you know, what causes a black hole to be active is just the, the presence of, of gas around it. Uh, you can have black holes with jets or, or without jets, as I was saying, and that depends on the conditions of the gas and how much gas you actually put into them. And also we think with the conditions of the magnetic field, if, you, if the gas around the black hole has a, a strong enough magnetic field that gets warped, 
essentially it's, it's like you know like the drain in a, in a bathtub uh, then you can launch a jet if you put a lot of gas very quickly and the magnetic field doesn't doesn't work around then you have something called a wind and you produce a, a lot of light a wind is like i don't know if you dive bomb into a swimming pool you know the water goes everywhere it's not like a hose where it's very highly collimated and it's on a, on a very straight line that travels very far it goes in in all directions and it loses the the energy a bit quicker Mm-hmm. I really like this example. With the, uh, <laughs> I, I just went with the, I went with the water example and ran away with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very nice. Uh, so, will all uh, these galaxies that have, I mean, as, apart from the dwarf galaxies, as you said, that don't really have supermassive black holes, will all these galaxies in the universe uh, have an active? in that sense, black hole at some point in their life? This is what we believe? I think, I think so. I mean, we, as far as we know, um, obviously we cannot observe these, these cycles directly because they last millions of years. But we have a downscale size in the form of X-ray binaries who, which have cycles in terms of days to weeks. And we know that they go through phases where they have jets, where they don't have jets, where they accrete, you know, eat the gas very fast or eat the gas very slowly. So we know that, you know, the, the black holes in, in galaxies are just an upsized version of these. And the physics must be similar with some caveats, with some, with some exemptions. So we know that the, the ones in galaxies also must go through these cycles. So our galaxy is not active now, but we know it's active. It's been active in the past and we can actually see some of the, some of the footprint that that has left. Uh, with a Meerkat telescope, which is in, in South Africa, we can see the remnants of these radio lobes. And the, the last episode uh, was about 200,000 years ago. So maybe not us as a species, but our immediate ancestors actually saw the Milky Way being active and having and having jets, which is something really exciting. You know, okay. we were figuring out tools. Our black hole was accreting and then producing these bubbles and these jets. Okay, that is fascinating, amazing. Uh, and Meerkat is a, a big radio telescope in uh, South Africa, right? Yes. And, uh, okay, how is it different from the other telescopes we know, like the, uh, you know, like for example, this this is that we. When you say a radio telescope, people think of a, of a single dish, yeah. Like a, like a single radio dish, uh, for mm-hmm. example, like a uh, Effelsberg. Yeah, uh, or even Arecibo or something like Arecibo, that. Arecibo, yes. Yeah. Well, Arecibo that's now gone. But yes, so radio telescopes essentially come in two flavors. You can have them as a single instrument or you can have them in networks, like the VLA, the, the one that you see in the film Contact, that is a, a network of, of dishes, of, of radio telescopes. And depending on the frequency you want to, to observe, you have different configurations, like LOFAR, for example, the, the telescope I use, uh, looks nothing like you imagine a radio telescope to be. We have two types of instruments. We have the high frequency ones, which are still very, very low frequency compared to most radio telescopes. This is 150 mega, megahertz, which is like, uh, is below the, the, you know, the frequencies that we use for, for radio. Um, I mean, to listen to the radio. And these look like boxes, essentially, with, with like metal circles inside them. And if you go to even lower frequencies, the LBA instrument looks like a clothes horse. It's essentially a, a, a stick of metal stuck in the ground uh, with some, some tent poles to, to keep it in place. So depending on what frequency you're, you're using, uh, you have very different instrument configurations uh, because the, the length of the radio wave, essentially the, you know, the, the, the shape of the radio wave, the, the crests and peaks are so far apart that you need to adapt uh, your instrument to observe that. And Meerkat, in, in a sense, um, is, is similar to this. It also has different types of, of antennas. Meerkat is actually going to be, is, is what we call, and Lofar is, is one of the SKA precursors, uh, but Meerkat is actually going to be incorporated into the SKA, the, S, the square kilometer array, uh, which is going to be, you know, the, the groundbreaking um, instrument of the, of the next few decades in, in terms of what radio astronomy is, is going to bring. So we will observe everything in the universe, in the radio. <laughs> Everything. I, I don't know if everything, but we will observe a lot more than, than we have in the past. I mean, you know, as astronomers, we always want more data. We always want bigger telescopes. We're never happy. <laughs> yeah, we're never happy with our current data. Every paper finishes like, yes, uh, we just need more data to prove this. <laughs> I know, I know. We, we're a bit um, <laughs> like that. But why not? I mean, we just want to solve the problems of the universe. There are exactly. so many questions to answer. We still don't know what a black hole is and why. I mean, we don't really understand why they have jets and, um, and why some don't have jets, for example, like you said, right? Uh, so it's a big 
everything is a big question mark we're getting there and uh, when we have a new telescope we discover things we've never seen before so new physics new things start exactly every every time we think we solve a question we open like three new ones so obviously we need better data to solve those new questions that have <laughs> popped up when we answered the one that we actually built the telescope for uh, yes uh, it's amazing i'm really looking forward to this uh, SKA era and uh, let's see what's going to bring to us because uh, these magnificent objects imagine seeing them in all their high detail as you see behind all these the jets and you see the path of the jets and the bubbles and as you said we can see the history of our galaxy right and we observe the history of our galaxy that it was active in the past and we only managed to do that with this brand new telescope yes it's fascinating um so tell us a bit what you do before i go to the uh to the quiz again because someone wants to play so uh, essentially I study the things that you see, the sort of things that you see behind me. I study the, the behavior of these jets as they, as they propagate through the, through the gas in the galaxy and through the gas in the intercluster medium, how they are shaped, because the, the shape of these things tells you something about the physics of how that interaction happened and, and how much energy was put into that, what the time scales are, and it helps us understand the, the life cycles of these things. So I study you know, the, the more, what we call the morphology, so the shape of these jets and the evolution and the life cycles of these, of these jetted black holes. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice. I, I like it because I also study. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I also study that. <laughs> it's, the, it's the best subject, really. <laughs> it's the best subject in the world. <laughs> it's number one in astronomy. Everything else is crap. <laughs> and, and all the no. <laughs> all observational times should go to this subject. <laughs> Absolutely. And you use LOFAR radio telescope. Mostly to, LOFAR, yes. Mostly, which is the low frequency array. And uh, can you tell us, it's not in only one country, right? It's in... No, it, it's a, it's a, a project led by, led by the Netherlands and the, the core of LOFAR is, is mostly contained in the Netherlands, but there are 10 drills all over Europe. So there are stations in Germany, in France, in the UK. Uh, there's now one in Northern Italy, there's one in Latvia. So it, it's, if you look at the map, essentially it's like a spider web of, of, uh, of telescopes that are spread all throughout Europe. And this is because the farther away you put the telescopes, the higher resolution you can get on your data, the, you know, the, the finest details you can, you can resolve in, and you can find in your, in your images. So you need both a lot of telescopes to collect a lot of light and you need to put them close enough at the, at the center to, to map the extended scale and far away at the edges to, to map these very tiny details in, in the center of the images. So I, I always call it the, the Dutch plan for one domination. <laughs> Because every, every time you look at it, there is one more station slightly further away, somewhere else in Europe. <laughs> Why not? I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing instrument and it opened up a new window, right? Yes. This uh, low frequency window uh, in, the, in the radio sky that was not accessible and especially not in, high, in this high detail to see yes. uh, all these uh, fantastic observations. Um, it's also doing a lot of for uh, understanding our atmosphere, understanding the ionosphere. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is one of the good side effects of having complicated data. You know, when when they started calibrating the data for this instrument, as you said, there was nothing before that was able to do this. Part of it is because the ionosphere is horrible for radio astronomy at these very low frequencies. It's super complicated. It changes in very quick time scale. So you have to model it very, very accurately. So one of the side effects of you know, calibration for this instrument having been a nightmare is that we also have learned a lot about the ionosphere and, and the structure of the ionosphere, uh, at least over the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you say world domination. <laughs> yes, that's very nice. And they, I, I know there are other things that coming out of Lover, not only related to radio astronomy, but uh, uh, other science related things. Also, they track lightnings, I think. Uh, yes, they can track lightning. They, they can track the, all the, the paths of lightning and the intensity and then try to rebuild that in 3D. It's, it's, it's amazing. And also technologically, obviously, they have developed different generations of instruments to try and improve this. So every big astronomy project always leads a, a very strong technological development that always you know, benefits the rest of us. The, the clearest example, obviously, that we always use is CCDs that were developed for astronomy and now you have them in your cameras and you have them in your phones to take pictures with. Yes, yes. So uh, you guys at home could take selfies and you like selfies, you can uh, thank astronomers for that because, you know, if it wasn't for astronomy, CCD, 
I mean, it was there. It would have happened. It was, yeah. we, it was there, hanging, you know, laying down. No one was using it. And we were like, okay, we'll use it. We'll use it. Okay. Jokes aside. Okay, I have one uh, more astronomy related question before the quiz because I have peer pressure to go to the quiz. <laughs> no, I want this. I want you to tell us because you mentioned it before about uh, this. Uh, active galaxies and how important they are for their hosts and their the evolution of the host and what do you mean by that i so, mean in the uni from when the galaxy is born in the early universe until it grows old so as i was saying you know we have this this definition of feedback you know where you put some stuff into the galaxy and the galaxy puts some stuff back into the into the universe this can happen through formation of stars you know through supernova explosions and it can happen through through these jets like the one you see behind me mm -hmm. so um it, this is the way in which active galaxies can influence the, the evolution of the universe when these jets again you can think of it as a, as, a, as a fire hose um you know when you point these these collimated jet of water at something you push it and you move it and you soak it <laughs> essentially um in, in a way jets do this as one they do this to, to the gas that is in the galaxy so they they heat it up and they move it and they displace it and they drive shocks the same kind of shock that you see you know a, a supersonic plane uh doing the you know supersonic jet doing the sky mm -hmm. um and this obviously causes uh changes in the in the evolution of this galaxy in the in the way it can form stars for example if you heat up the gas it can no longer collapse and, and form stars if you move it uh with a shock for example you can compress it and you can actually produce more stars in that region you can you can trigger star formation and when you push the, the jets into the intercluster medium you can heat up the gas and keep it from falling back into the galaxy and again forming further generations of stars. That's very nice. Uh, we love radio galaxies again. <laughs> uh, but how did the, our galaxy end up not being active? It's it's their life cycle, right? This exactly, yeah. Happens. I mean, in a, in a way, when these black holes produce jets and, and produce, you know, all, all sorts of emission and push the gas away, they're sabotaging themselves because they need the gas to to stay active if you don't have an, enough gas to to accrete you cannot produce radiation and you cannot produce jets so by pushing it away they're not only you know frustrating the galaxy and keeping it from forming stars they're also preventing themselves from accreting further so our galaxy at some point it did have a supply of gas near the black hole at this point it doesn't and it potentially will again in in the future because some of the gas that is you know pushed around from star formation or galaxy is actively forming stars even not so much in the central region but certainly in the arms or we can get some gas from a merger we're actually merging uh, with, with a small galaxy at the moment, and, and we have satellites that might potentially emerge in the future, all of these will eventually make its way to, to the black hole and, and make it start accreting again. Excellent. Uh, guys, I don't know if you're fascinated. I'm fascinated. Okay, this is amazing. AGN are the best. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I really like the picture that you made that the black hole is sabotaging itself. And uh, it's like, oops. <laughs> oh no, all my gas is gone. Oops, gone, it's gone. Oh, maybe, maybe the black hole wants to a little quiet time, you know? It's yeah, okay. I mean, after you have a big Christmas meal, you know, you need some, some time to rest. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> okay, so quiz, quiz, quiz. It's your time, my dear. Right. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Before I say, oh, don't move too much. Don't move too much. There you go. That's the one. Okay, so we did the GWST. So we now, oh, okay. I have to admit, I had to Google this one. Well, <laughs> Paul uh, wrote this question. I didn't have to Google it. He didn't have to Google it because he knows everything. He was born with knowledge. So the third one is, a famous Italian painter created the fresco showing Halley's Comet over Bethlehem. Therefore, the European Space Agency named their spacecraft to that comment to that comet in 1986. And the name of the Giotto. person <laughs> it's uh, Rafael Giotto Botticelli or Michelangelo. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's Giotto, yeah. Giotto. Okay, okay, guys, you know everything. Okay, guys. Next one. Oh. Happy New Year. <laughs> On January 1st, uh, 1801, the astronomer and Catholic priest Giuseppe Piazzi discovered the Palermo Observatory. What did he discover? Draft planet. Shh, his third comet. 
Algor the first variable star ever detected? Dwarf planet Ceres, the first object to be named an asteroid? Or Canis Major dwarf galaxy? Yes, sir. The closest in the vicinity of our Milky Way? Yes, let, let the other people say. I have no idea. Uh, so I'm going to go with Aris's answer because he knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, that is, okay, I will, I will say it. it's, it's true. I also had to Google that. I don't know. Uh, of course, he didn't know it was a dwarf uh, planet. They didn't know what the dwarf planet was in 1801. Uh, so if I remember right, the story, Herschel named it an asteroid, mm -hmm. but then, um, what's his name, Piazzi, uh, said, no, this doesn't look like that. It's something else. And he didn't accept the name asteroid. After that, they found many asteroids around, uh, in between, sorry, Mars and Jupiter, the mm -hmm. asteroid belt where Ceres uh, lies and other big uh, bodies like that. Uh, but at the time it was, you know, something new. And with something, I think something like that. At least when I read the article, they said he discovered it with this telescope. So interesting. Right, one more. Okay, I will put this. Yes, Giotto says, let's see. Um, oh, okay, so this is a big debate, right? Between astronomy and religion. It's about the real star of Bethlehem and what it can possibly be. What is our explanation? Um, so what is it? Is it the triple conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn um, in 7 BC before Christ? Is it a conjunction of Venus, Jupiter and Regulus star in 2 BC? Um, the appearance of Halley's Comet in 12 BC or a supernova in the constellation of Aquila in 4 BC? You chose then? How about you, Batteries? I think, I, I think people used to think it was Halley's Comet, but I'm not sure about that. I've, I've seen things back and forth on that. Um, so yeah, but my guess would be either Halley's Comet or the, or the supernova in 4 BC, one of the two. But um, so we have no clue, <laughs> right? Yeah, we have no clue because the, so it doesn't match the zero. <laughs> no, but I mean, we've, we've redefined the calendar so many times since then, you know. I yeah. got something. You got something. A coincidence of Venus, Jupiter, and Regulus 2 BC. Ah, you have this one, the conjunction between Venus, Jupiter, and Regulus. That was also very bright. I mean, they could have followed Venus, who knows? but maybe they would end up in a different place <laughs> after a while. Yes, it's, um, it's a mystery. Okay, yeah. I, will, I, will, I will go with you uh, on this one. Actually, um, we don't really know. We cannot be sure. No, I mean, we also don't know what has been retroactively fit. You know, somebody might have spotted Halley's comment later on and interpreted that that must have been the thing. And that's why it's been depicted as such. So yeah, yeah it's, it's hard. I will find it, and uh, so I have a video on that um, about the Christmas star and what it can be and the possible explanations. I will put it in the chat in a bit. It's excellent. Uh, we'll do this one also. How many more do we have? We don't want to do them all now. Okay, we'll do this one and leave the, re the rest for the last one. So, uh, oh, hello, X-ray astronomer. <laughs> so this one is for you. <laughs> <laughs> right, in December 2021, actually on the 9th, of, uh, 9th or 8th of uh, December, a few days ago, right, uh, NASA and the Italian Space Agency, so international collaboration, uh, they launched an X-ray telescope named ROSAT, Chandra, XP, or XMM. Okay, that has to be XP, but I didn't know it had already been launched. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so disconnected. But yes, yes it has to be XP. So Rosat uh, worked in the 1980s. Chandra and XMM were both launched in 1999. So it has to be XP anyway. But yes, I, I know uh, XP was planned for launch. I just didn't know when, when the launch actually was. 
Το βρήκε. Μπράβο. He, he found it. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I didn't know either. And then a friend of mine who was actually working uh, on that um, posted it on Facebook and I found out. Because, you know, we are so excited about uh, James Webb uh, launch very soon, hopefully, uh, that we We have forgotten everything, anything else exists. I've been too busy writing papers. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we will do this later. So we will go back to Beatrice and the, and the last questions, and then we will do the last quiz questions, okay? Let's do this all very fast. Right, so let me find my questions. Only five questions more than that. Yeah. Oh, okay, good, we, we have it. I, I'm sure we're gonna win. Well, you mean I'm gonna You're win. gonna win, of course. All the presents for you. Okay, so now I want to take you away from Active Galaxies, right? And ask you what else you would like to study and research if you didn't study Active Galaxies. And what? In astronomy. Yes, in astronomy and maybe outside. Outside of astronomy. So the other thing that I found really fascinating when I was thinking what to do for my PhD is uh, nuclear astrophysics. I actually really liked nuclear physics at university, not as a weapon of destruction, but as a potential energy source. Uh, So that's my second part of the answer. But yes, for the first part, so nuclear astrophysics studies how elements form in stars and how to detect uh, radioactive decays at specific wavelengths to try and trace the evolution of these elements, you know, and and the evolution of supernovae uh, with different uh, properties throughout the history of the universe. So these would have been, I think, my, my second choice something to study something galactic rather than extra galactic so something in our own in our own galaxy mostly um, but outside of astronomy i think if i had to do something else i would probably want to use my knowledge for good <laughs> so uh, rather than make a, a bunker even richer i would probably want to do um if, if, if it was something physics related it would probably be working on nuclear fusion uh there there's plenty of research on, on that going on in the in the uk so something data science oriented perhaps related to, to nuclear fusion to produce clean energy in the future or um maybe something related to again you know trying to find solutions for for you know to fight climate change and, and to try and minimize the, its impact because i think it's unavoidable <laughs> mm, very nice and that's amazing i'm, I'm jealous <laughs> no that's uh, that's great and yes um Uh, I like the idea of also uh, studying something closer, you know, astrophysics related, but closer, not so far yes. away. <laughs> that it takes so much time to observe these objects that are yeah. far away, right? I yeah. miss sometimes, you know, the, the problem with astrophysics is it's so intangible. Sometimes I'm, I, I'm really jealous of the people who still do lab stuff because you know, they can touch their instruments and they can see the results there and they can draw them on a graph there. And you have to wait months sometimes, you know, to get the data and you cannot actually touch what you're studying. Yes, uh, we, we never touch these galaxies. <laughs> I mean, uh, and also we cannot do an experiment with a galaxy, right? It's, not, it's yeah. what you said before. We cannot perform an experiment, say, okay, uh, let's uh, see how this galaxy is born and study it for its own life. We study a snapshot. We study that time when, he, when a galaxy was like, I don't know, 20 years old, let's say, uh, in human years. Uh, and we cannot study when he, the galaxy was zero or when it will die. We can do this with simulations, but and uh, it's very computationally expensive and there's a lot that goes into that and it's not that extremely accurate as the universe it's I mean, always an approximation because we yeah. have to build our own assumptions of the yeah. physics into into it what we can do is look at a similar galaxy that's maybe younger or older and think you know this is what our galaxy must have looked before or will look later exactly uh, so Okay, the Santa's little helper left the room. <laughs> uh, okay, what will be the next big discovery in astrophysics, let's say? Let's Ooh, uh, that's, I think that's really hard to predict. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, with, with uh, things like Plato, there will be something big coming on the exoplanets front, for example. Uh, but the, the one I'm looking forward to is, you know, on these, on these big observatories that we have for the, for the next generation, you know, in the radio, we have the square kilometer array, we have JWST, James Webb, uh, that's going to cover the infrared and, and some of the optical, we have um, 
um, LSST, uh, the Vera Rubin telescope that's going to cover some of the optical as well. Uh, and we have Athena coming up in X-rays. All of these are going to, you know, among other things, they're going to be looking at the early universe, the early stages of the evolution of the universe and things like exp expansion and stuff. So what I'm looking forward to is gaining that insight into the early stages of the universe that we don't understand at the moment, how black holes formed, essentially. That's, you know, the thing that hits closest to home, I think, for both of us, is understanding how these supermassive black holes actually came to be. Because we see the small ones, we see the big ones, but we don't actually see most of the intermediate ones that we know must have, must have grown to the big ones. So we want to understand where these come from. Very nice. And uh, OK, I, I'm sorry for the last question. So tell us what thing you miss from work from the working life before the pandemic and one that you don't miss. <laughs> so what I do miss is seeing people really going to conferences and, and talking to colleagues. That's such an important thing in science. You know, even stupid conversations that you have over coffee sometimes trigger ideas and you can mimic that in, you know, in virtual meetings. And sometimes I've started work through meeting people on Twitter, for example, which is it's great and it helps, but it's not the same as sitting down with a bunch of people and, and discussing things over a coffee or a pint. It really doesn't doesn't mimic that. That's something I really, really miss. Uh, things I don't miss are being stuck in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the, the, the commute is good in a sense that, you know, it makes a break at the moment. It's very difficult to, to stop the working day because there's nothing to interrupt unless, you know, my partner shouts at me or the cat demands some food. Uh, but uh, at the same time, yes, I don't miss being stuck in traffic. Unfortunately, the, the UK is not very good in terms of public transport outside of London. And, and for most places, you, you need to commute by car, yeah. which yeah. is not very eco-friendly. I understand that uh, here too, this little city of Vienna has like one street, right? And uh, all the traffic, even the big trucks pass through that street. Oh, wow. uh, but uh, our offices are in a very nice forest, inside the forest. I've seen it, I'm very jealous. <laughs> so you have to come and visit us, right? Okay, when when we're allowed to have lives again, <laughs> you have to come visit us. It's a wonderful really place. And then you can see the lover field. We also have, a lofar field. You have your own lofar field. Yes, come in. <laughs> and sometimes we have coffee on top of the HBA. <laughs> and I didn't say that. I didn't say that. There is no photographic evidence. <laughs> uh, so, quiz time. Quiz time. Are you coming? Okay, so now we will do the, the last of the quiz. Oh, Ooh, wow. <laughs> you broke the bed. You broke the bed. So, okay. So, listen, guys, before we do the last uh, quiz on the chat, I put a link. <laughs> okay, before uh, on the chat, I put a link about a video made uh, about the Christmas star and our explanations, our scientists. You can have a look. This was filmed at the Astronomy on Tap Bonn a couple of years ago when we could do things at a pub. And it was a very nice uh, feeling. Actually, I watched it and I felt very jealous. I wanted to be in the pub again and talk about science. And also, if you have any questions uh, for batteries, please type them uh, on the chat and we will answer them. Let's do the quiz. Let me find my... At least we'll try to answer them. No Sorry? At least we'll try to answer the questions, no promises. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, I mean, I understand people are also tired from all these uh, online meetings and maybe they are celebrating Christmas already, like us. Apparently, it's very funny to jump on the bed. Yes, okay, this is, this is not TikTok, okay? <laughs> no. TikTok influence. I know, yeah. Let's, let's do this, okay? I know. Yes. Yeah, you, no, you don't. Yes, I know. Okay, Comet Leonard. So I don't know if you've heard, right? There is a new comet in town. <laughs> so it's approached, it approached the Earth. It's Leonard. called Leonard. Leonard. Why, why? Why? I like to call it Leonard. Leonard. Okay, Leonard. Comet Leonard. <laughs> uh, it's visible in the night uh, sky during December. Okay, you can you can. It's very faint though. Will uh, so what will happen to it? What I know it. Will it crash in the sun and become one with the sun? Will it go around the sun and then you know keep coming back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, or will it go around the sun and leave the solar system? 
Like, um, I've, been well. busy writing, I've been busy writing papers. I haven't even realized that there was a I comment. I, I did see Neo Wise a, a couple of summers ago. Um, yeah. So statistically, I think the second answer is most likely. Um, yeah. I got it. Are you are you sure? Go you, on the sun and keep coming do, back. Do you want to change your answer? No. Okay. So I will I will give the answer. Okay, I will give the answer. Uh, it it's not correct. No, actually, this one will leave us forever. Okay. Will, yeah. Apparently. So we only found out about I found out about it a few days ago. Yeah, uh, Paul sent me some you? photos. Why are you yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it will go around the sun and leave our solar amazing. I yes. had it like that. Yeah. You had it like that? Okay. Uh, so goodbye forever. It will be expelled from our solar system. Um, yeah, I mean, they, as you said, statistically, these objects. I mean, they get uh, drawn from uh, this asteroid, well, the Oort cloud, whatever, the Kuiper belt outside uh, the orbit of, um, I want to say Pluto. <laughs> For me, it's still a planet. Uh, no, and they get drawn. It is a second planet. It is, <laughs> it's a dwarf planet. It get drawn, okay, by the gravity of the sun and they have an elliptical orbit. And then they go around the sun, like, I don't have a ball. Give, give me the, there you go. We have a bunny here. They go, they go, they come from here. They go around the sun and they go back. And they will do that. Or we will do that, we'll do that, we'll do that, we'll do that. Let's take your bunny. But this one will actually go. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. So, oh, okay. So we saw a solar eclipse. There was another, so you've been busy writing papers. I also missed that, to be honest. It was a solar eclipse last week, if I remember, in Antarctica. Week? Yes, I, yeah. Oh, gosh, I really need to emerge from <laughs> writing papers more often. Stop writing papers. Uh, okay, okay, stop writing papers, okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I understand. It's the end of the year and you want to finish them. Right? Yes, exactly. I, I want yeah. to have a break. <laughs> I know, I know, I know what you mean. Uh, so... The question is, the next solar eclipse, uh, total, total solar eclipse, is in 2.22, true or false? I can't remember, to be honest. I mean, uh, I think that you... might be true. It's just it won't be observable from where we are, I think. Mm, it's a false. Is it false? Okay. It's, it's a false. Oh, you have it correct. It, it oh would be, I think, in 2024. 2023. 2023. April, okay. if, I, if I if I'm not mistaken, April. Uh, yes, uh, in we have those. two in 2022, but I don't think they're chosen. I okay. don't think they're chosen. Maybe yeah. Uh, yes. Good. So, is this the last one? No. Nope. But this is very nice. Look at this one. That's, that's really pretty. It's pretty. No. Well, uh, this is the flame nebula. You see it here in green. The one thing. And uh, it's in the constellation of Orion. And this green green thing here, which uh, wavelength uh, is it? This image hmm. of flame nebula in a Optical? in the constellation of Orion <laughs> was taken at which? I think the the green is probably infrared. Infrared, very nice, very nice. It's a it's a classic color they use to false wow. uh, color. These infrared images, very nice. Uh, it's not radio. It's not X rays. Ooh, uh, the next one. Optical, cool. no, but probably the superposition. I mean, like the next the stars. Yes. I imagine that the the, the like, other colors, the ones that make white, are, are probably optical, and, and green is infrared. Mm -hmm. For X rays, we usually choose blue or purple, and for radio, we usually choose red mm -hmm. or orange. Yes, and this is an image with Ys for the ones who know. Uh, and that's a, a very bright star, 10 times the massive, oh, as massive as our sun or something. Um, if I remember correctly, it's a star forming region. Right. Oh, I love this one. You know that uh, Perseverance took a helicopter in Mars. I don't know if you missed that also because. No, I did follow that. I did, I did follow that. <laughs> Okay, you, you read it was this really one. exciting. 
You read this one, I drink the other. In 2021, NASA flew the first helicopter on Mars. The longest flight duration to date is? To date is? So the longest flight that it 40 took. 40 seconds, it, it did, 90 seconds. One, on one go, right? 40 seconds, 90 seconds, 130 seconds, or 170. Oh, uh, I don't remember this. I, it's either 90 or 170, but I can't remember which one. Um, you, you? 170, wow. Maybe this kid knows a lot of uh, astronomical facts. Well, I just guess. <laughs> it is a hand, oops, I'm sorry. It is a it hand, is 170. It yes. is 170, yes. Oh, the and next one is the last one. Yes. Excellent. So the <laughs> Can I that was wait wait let's give us some facts. This was uh, in in the mission. So part of the mission mm -hmm. because the uh, the scheduled mission finished uh, and now they're just testing it and pushing the limits. Uh, but it's still going. So that's amazing. Uh, right. There's something we do a lot. We we plan a mission for you know an or a telescope for a while and then because it works so well. We build it with so many fail safes in place. We can keep using it for many years, like XMM and Chandra, for example, which you had earlier, were only built to work for about five years and they've been up over 20 now. Wow, amazing. Yes. <laughs> so I hope you guys know Greek. <laughs> he, he wants to open a Christmas present, but you they have under the tree. You said you right. don't like books. <laughs> well, it's not a book. Okay, so it's read. no angel in space, sharpless two, one oh six nebula, and star forming with yon lies in the <coughs> constellation of Zygnos. Alexa, stop. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so uh, this <laughs> Alexa, stop. Oh my god, okay. No, it is like the pub today. All right, so the snow angel in space, uh, it's a nebula and star forming region, right? Is it in the constellation of Cygnus? I have no idea. I'm going to go with true because it's a 50 50 chance. Yeah. It's a true. It's a true. Yeah. It's a true. Okay, okay, okay. Do I send your answers. There you go. I, I sent mine. I'll send so I I'll think send you're missing one of the answers. If you if you scroll no. back to questions, yes, the one of the infrared. Oh no! How did I do that? Wait, wait, wait. All I the others, I think, are okay. I want to win. I won. <laughs> I won. And I won. I, mommy. <laughs> mommy, I won. I won. Mommy. Okay. So let's let's see the results. Good. No, so I can submit it. Submit it. You have an email. Yes. Oh, okay. Huh? Submit another okay, response. Okay. Another response. <gasps> no. How is it possible that I didn't get it? Frequently missed questions. This one. Ah, sorry for the. I shouldn't be showing the emails. Um. I'm sorry. Mommy, <laughs> get Oh. Uh, uh, mommy. Ah, no. Everything is correct. I, I know what, what happened. Uh, I know what happened. I got everything. Yeah, you got everything. I know what uh, happened. No. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, so the question about the Christmas star had all the answers correct. Uh, wait. Because we're all winners. And thank you for playing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I have to say that uh, I wanted to put something on the live chat. Uh, it's the log of uh, the ingenuity, the ingenuity flight log. Okay. Um, yeah. So it gives you all the details about the flight of ingenuity. It's, it's really cool. <laughs> hey, what the fuck? Hey, hey, this is a, this is so a good show. We don't swear here. Don't say what the fuck. <laughs> so, we came to the end of this Christmas special. That we and now extra I feel extra really special. I, and now you can sing the Christmas song. <laughs> so, Beatrice, thank you very much for being here with us tonight. 
Thank you very much for hosting me. It's been great. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the craziness of tonight. It was yes. uh, it, it was a bit different uh, than the other times. Now I can open it. <laughs> no. Christmas presents at Christmas. <laughs> I'm, I'm being bullied. <laughs> Can I say goodbye to the people? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, it was my pleasure having you here and you guys from home. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions about radio uh, galaxies, send an email to Beatrice or to me or try to contact us at uh, aotyena at gmail.com and we'll, uh, or write under you know this video and we will come back to you with questions. And the next one is in the new year, uh, on the second Tuesday of uh january so this is january 11 okay at seven o'clock uh, central european so good thank you very much i hope you managed to finish all the papers and uh you have no work left and you go and have a great time likewise uh, i hope you can have some rest <laughs> <laughs> yes yes it's gonna be an interesting christmas if you see like that I will give presents and in exchange I'll get peace and quiet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that sounds don't, good. Don't ruin my look. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much and have a good <laughs> night. Thank you very much. Have a good night and happy Christmas, everyone. Happy Christmas. Bye. 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 Bye.